Aloha. He is risen. So glad that you guys are all with us today. Welcome at Como Mai. We're also glad for all of our online folks that are here with us. I've been chatting with a bunch of you this morning. We're glad you guys are here. Don't forget to click that share button. Help us extend our reach to as many people on your friends list as possible as well. Before we get into the message, a couple of quick announcements. Don't forget, we're painting the inside of all the fellowship hall buildings, uh, all the fellowship buildings rooms. And uh, we're doing that Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. If you can be here at 10 a.m. to help with that, Knut and Doug would really appreciate uh, the help. If you have any 9-inch rollers with an extension handle, they could really use that too. There's a couple of high spots. be nice to hit a couple of those. Knut and Doug have a great plan in place. They just need some willing participants to help make it all come together. So if you can help with that, Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Also, don't forget, we've got a couples aloha group, a new couples small group that's starting next Sunday, right after this service at the Makoff's home. If you are a couple and would like to be a part of that group, let us know, and we'll try to get you plugged into that. We also start our youth group, our very first youth group ever, yay God, yeah. uh, starts this coming Friday night, and we're going to do that to start with at the Makeoff family home as well, and then we're going to go from there. We might hopefully get back to the property uh, over the next few months if things keep turning around for the better. Let's keep praying things turn around for the better, amen? So, when you entered the worship center this morning, I handed each of you two dead bodies. And if you're watching online, that statement has just freaked you out, right? So if you're at home, these are just paper dolls. So if you've got some time, grab a couple sheets of paper and cut out some paper dolls. And uh, if you don't want to do that, just get a couple pieces of paper. That'll work for you at home as well. That comes a little bit later in the message. So I'll ask you again. A couple of paper dolls have blown away a little bit so we can make sure you get two. You want to have two. You don't need one for the service today, but you're going to take one home with you. So when we get to that part, we'll make sure everybody's got two. That comes on a little bit later. Now, normally the first Sunday of the month is Communion Sunday, but we just did Communion Friday night at Good Friday service. So we're going to wait and do communion again on the first Sunday in May. So don't forget, there's three ways to support the ministry of the church financially. Number one, you can use the Yay God boxes out in the lobby. Those little black boxes right beside the door as you come and go. You can just drop your offering right in there. That works great. You can also use the online giving address that you see on the screen, or you can mail a check to the P.O. box. That works as well. We really appreciate your support of this ministry. Every single penny helps. Well, we're calling today's message, Rise, One Truth That Will Change Your Entire Life. And I want to begin like this. Here in the center of the table, this box for us today represents Easter Sunday and the resurrection of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And this empty box is going to be a reminder of the empty tomb for Jesus for us today and a reminder throughout the service that he's no longer dead, but he has risen. He has risen indeed, and he wants you to rise as well. That's what we're talking about this morning. Uh, both in this life and in the next life, Jesus wants you to rise. So the box is going to come into play a little bit later in the message as well, so just don't forget about it. If you're ready to hear what God's put on my heart to share with you this morning, would you do me a favor and say, hit me with it, G, I'm ready. Awesome. So it's the Sunday after the crucifixion of Jesus. A couple of days have passed since Jesus' death. And then the 24th gospel, the 24th chapter of the Gospel of Luke tells us this. Now on the first day of the week, at early dawn, the women went to the tomb. Sun came up, they said, let's head to the tomb. Taking the aromatic spices they had prepared. Now they didn't practice embalming in ancient Jerusalem, so the aromatic spices were to help cover the stench of decaying flesh. And the normal anointing process that was usually done right when you put somebody in a tomb, that was interrupted because there was a quick process of getting Jesus buried. The Passover Sabbath was about to begin, and they didn't want to do that during the Sabbath. So they put him in there on Friday, and they came back on Sunday. Look at the next verse. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the tomb. When they put Jesus in there, they sealed the tomb with a big stone. They put the seal of Pilate across the front of it, punishable by death if anyone broke the seal, if anyone moved the stone. But when they went in, when they went inside the tomb, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. 
And now look at verses 4 and 5. While they, Mary and the other women who went to the tomb, while they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood beside them in dazzling attire. These were angels. And the women were terribly frightened, and they bowed their faces to the ground. But the men, the angels, said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? I want you to hold on to that thought because we're going to come back to it this morning. Would you say it aloud with me? It's on the screens. Why do you look for the living among the dead? Let's say it one more time. Why do you look for the living among the dead? Indeed. The angels continued. Look at verses 6 through 9. He is not here. He's not in the empty tomb, but has been raised. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise again? And then the women remembered his words. And when they returned from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest of the disciples. So Mary and the other women went to the tomb expecting to find the dead body of Jesus. Peter and John later made their way to the tomb expecting to find the dead body of Jesus. They all made the same mistake. They all went to a graveyard expecting Yeshua to be there dead in the tomb. And from their point of view, that was not at all unreasonable. They saw him die. They buried his dead body in this tomb a couple of days ago. So obviously... We're going to find him in the tomb. That seems logical. But they went to the tomb, and Jesus was not there. He had risen. My God's not dead. He's surely alive. He's living on the inside, roaring like a lion, right? And so Jesus was no longer dead. He was alive. The tomb was empty. Now, of course, they all should have known that was going to happen. They should have known he was going to be alive because Jesus had repeatedly told them. He was going to rise from the dead on the third day. It's all over the Gospels. So instead of going to the tomb perplexed and frightened and mournful, they should have shown up with a caterer and their party clothes on, ready to whoop it up, right? Expecting Jesus to be alive. They should have been able to hear him singing, I'm coming up so you better get this party started, right? These two angels, they asked Mary and the others this very poignant question, Why do you look for the living among the dead? That's a great question, right? Because the dead and the living, they don't typically hang out together much, do they? Except in zombie movies, right? Why do you look for the living among the dead? Duh. However, before we frown on Mary and the other women and the disciples who went to the tomb looking for the living among the dead, we need to admit this to ourselves. We still do that a lot too as human beings, don't we? Like the men and women at the tomb, we too often look for life in dead places, in dead practices, in dead relationships, in dead things. We look for meaning, purpose, adventure, happiness, fulfillment, direction, joy, significance. We look for all of those things in unhealthy, unhelpful, unlikely, sometimes dead places. And yet Jesus is the only place we'll ever truly find these things. He said in John 10, 10, the thief, the devil, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come so that they may have life and may have it abundantly. And so Jesus's abundant life plan is full to overflowing. It's exceeding. It's overwhelming with joy and purpose and direction. And yet we routinely in our lives choose lesser things. We routinely follow destructive desires. We practice destructive habits. We pursue destructive relationships in the wrong places at the wrong times for the wrong reasons with the wrong people. And all of these choices kill us on the inside and they drive us further away from God and His plan of abundant life for us. The truth is everyone wants to experience the kind of abundant life that Jesus is promising to us, that he's offering to us, but instead we often tend to go looking for the living among the dead. We go looking for the fullness of life among the empty things that the world has to offer. It's the same as looking for life in graveyards. And so we end up messing up and missing out on what God wants to show us in life. We miss out on becoming who God wants us to be in life. Jesus promised us this in John 7, Let the one who believes in me drink, just as the scripture says, from within him will flow rivers of living water. Doesn't that 
sound great? Wouldn't you love for that to really be true of you spiritually, emotionally, physically, mentally every single day? Wouldn't you love to wake up every single morning and just feel like you have rivers of living water flowing in you, through you, out of you, infusing you and everything and everyone you care about with power and purpose and energy and direction and joy? Yay, God? Yeah, God, right? Right. If you're ready for that, would you just say a short prayer after me? I'll guide you in it. I'll say it and you repeat after me. Let's say, I am ready, Lord Jesus. Let your living water of abundant life burst through me into every arena of my world. Amen. So where does it come from? Where do we get that living water? Jesus told us, he said, let the one who believes in me drink me in. Listen, don't miss this, listen. A life characterized by the idea of rivers of living water that happens when we drink in the person, when we drink in the character, when we drink in the teachings, when we drink in the acts of our God, our creator, Jesus Christ. We are drinking living water whenever we're putting our faith in Christ. And so I'm talking about a daily dependence, a minute-by-minute spiritual connection to Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit of God, a close relationship where we actually live like we really believe that the Creator of the universe, through His Holy Spirit, lives in us and is roaring like a lion, ready and willing to direct our lives with abundant fullness of purpose and meaning. If you can really embrace and live this one truth, it will change your entire life. And you will rise up and you will live the abundant life that Jesus promised to us. If you only take away one thing from the message today, let this be it. Remember, this message is called Rise, One Truth That Will Change Your Entire Life. This is the truth. Here's the one truth I want you to be sure you get today. Let your relationship with God replace your religion about God. Let me say it again. Let your relationship with God replace your religion about God. If you can do that, that's one truth that will change your life. So why in the world do we instead so often go looking for meaning in empty places? We go looking for life among dead things. Why do we so often seek significance in hollow practices? Why do we block the channels of the river of life? Why do we dam up the flow of living water and create stagnant ponds of death inside of us instead? Why do we so often choose our way instead of God's ways? Solomon wrote these words in Proverbs 16, there is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way that leads to death. There is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way that leads to death. How does that play out in our daily life? Think about the high school student or the college student. She's considered outgoing and fun. Everybody knows her to be the life of the party. She comes across witty and sociable and intelligent and happy to everyone. But the truth be told, on the inside, when she's alone with her thoughts, she's deeply lonely. She's bitter about life. She's empty. She's depressed, even suicidal Sometimes she drowns her sorrows with beer bongs and weed bongs every weekend. She bounces from one guy to the next. She pretends she doesn't feel dead inside. She's looking for love in all the wrong places, as the song goes, right? Looking for love in all the wrong places. Looking for love in too many faces. She wants something more in life. But what she actually wants though she doesn't realize it, is the abundant life that only Jesus offers. She can't find it. It won't rise up inside of her. Why? Because she's looking for the living among the dead. There is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way that leads to death. Or consider the businessman. He, he never seemed to be able to make his dad proud as a child, and now he's driven to be a people pleaser. He's driven to be a success hound. He's driven to be a workaholic. And he thinks, if I can just get the next promotion, if I can just get that next raise, if I can just land that next deal, then everybody will finally know that I mean something, that I matter. I'll finally be successful. 
He's so driven by this broken child need that he works his way, uh, his whole life away. He misses out on a great relationship with his kids and with his wife. He's taking what they're living because he's working for a given, right? He's, he wants something more. He wants what he actually wants, though he doesn't realize it, is abundant life that only Jesus offers. He can't find it. It won't rise up inside of him because he's looking for the living among the dead. And again, there is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way that leads to death. Or maybe think about the housewife with four kids in a minivan. She's lost in the day-to-day drone of suburbia. And everyone compliments her on her well-kept home, her well-behaved children, her immaculate appearance. But the truth is, she's just going through the motions. She's on every volunteer committee on the Big Island. She's dying inside, though, a little bit every day. An alcoholic home, an overly critical parent as a child left her feeling unattractive, unimportant, unlovable, and now she lives with the constant expectations of her husband and her kids to always do more, to always give more, to always be more, always expected to be the giver, always made to feel guilty for wanting to receive any love herself. She just keeps pouring herself out for others without ever getting refilled. She's running on empty, right? She welcomes sleep at the end of the day because it's the only time no one expects anything from her. Often she helps sleep along with some extra alcohol or some extra medication, anything to knock her out until the whole thing starts all over again the next morning. She wants something more in life. What she actually wants, though she doesn't realize it, it's the abundant life that only Jesus can give and she can't find it it won't rise up inside of her because she's looking for the living among the dead there is a way that seems right to a person but its end is the way that leads to death i could go on all morning telling these stories like these but sooner or later we all know i would eventually get to your story right i would eventually hit on the way that you still sometimes look for the living among the dead. We would eventually hear about the way that seems right to you. Maybe the only way you've ever known. But its end is the way that leads to death. The death of dreams, the death of joy, the death of meaning, the death of adventure, the death of significance, the death of abundant life. So just insert your story here. Why can't we see the reality in our lives? Why do we keep looking for the living among the dead? And if we're honest with ourselves, we all desperately want to have abundant life flowing out of our actions and thoughts like fountains, like raging rivers of living water. But the reality is we usually end up looking for the living while surrounded by the dead in a graveyard of missed opportunities, regrets, and disappointments. So eventually what happens? Most people just give up. They just settle for less, an ordinary life. They just decide to mark their time and try to numb their pain the best they can. And so every year on Easter Sunday, they get up, they dress up, and they go to church. And the pastor says, Christ is risen, and everyone responds, he is risen indeed. And they sing, up from the grave he arose, or they sing amazing grace, but then they go home completely unchanged, unfulfilled, and they just, truth be told, return to pursuing the same dead things tomorrow that always left them feeling empty at the end of the day yesterday. So here's a tough question for you to think about. If you're watching online, this is for you as well. Is that true for you? Do you have no experience of an abundant spiritual life at all? Do you have no river of abundant life flowing through you at all? And if that's true, let me ask you another serious question today. Aren't you tired of that? Aren't you tired of that? Aren't you tired of empty living? Don't you long for a life of adventure, a life of significance, a life of abundant purpose, meaning, joy, fulfillment, a life of soaring above the level of mediocrity? It's fantastic news. Jesus is risen. That's a big yay God, right? That's fantastic news. But what do we do with that information? What's the next step of your life? Jesus is risen, but that's not a new thing. That happened 1,988 years ago. Jesus was risen then, too. What has happened in you since you first believed that? How have you risen in your life 
Eternal life is given to you by placing your faith in Christ. I hope you've made that decision at some point in your life to claim Jesus as the hero, the God, the rescuer, the leader of your life. If not, I'm going to give you a chance to do that before we finish today. Or maybe you would say, no, my story is this, Greg. I have already have eternal life. I know that. I've put my faith in Christ, but I am still missing out on this abundant life thing. I've got the eternal life. I'm, I'm not confident of that, but I'm missing out on the abundant life. If you've already become a follower of Jesus Christ, don't make the mistake of being so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Being a follower of Christ is not just fire insurance. Becoming a Christian is not just a getting out of hell free card, right? It's not about riding the glory train to heaven. Following Christ is also all about how you live on earth in this life. Letting Christ live through you, letting Christ love people through you, bringing the kingdom of God to your part of the world through you, being a living water river to a world that's dying of spiritual thirst. Amen? Unfortunately, what happens? Instead of always seeking out Jesus' guidance and wisdom and direction before we make decisions, we often tend to listen to the counterfeiter, the thief, the devil who wants to steal, kill, and destroy in our life. The Apostle Peter, because of his hard-learned experience in this matter, he warned us about our enemy. We talked about this recently on a Sunday morning. 1 Peter 5.8, be sober and alert. Your enemy, the devil, like a roaring lion, is on the prowl looking for someone to devour. How does he do that? He does this by tricking us into seeking a happy life and a bigger paycheck or a bigger house, or a newer car, or a younger lover. He convinces us joy and happiness can be found at the bottom of a bottle, or at the end of a joint, at the end of a meth pipe, or at the end of a Ben and Jerry's ice cream pint, or through an illicit affair, or through a so-called adult website. The devil tries to bury us alive with workaholism, or abusive relationships, or people-pleasing needs, or codependency struggles, or through control attempts of anger, or resentment, or jealousy, or gossip. He tries to trap us in a casket. He tries to bury us in a tomb. He tries to burn us alive to dump our ashes into an urn, a, a, a burial urn. We find ourselves doomed in a death spiral of self-destructive pursuits, always seeking life in behaviors of death. Don't be misled. Our enemy is always prowling around us, seeking to devour us. We will never find fulfillment in life, these dead ways, never. To do so is to look for the living among the dead. We need to know the truth because as Jesus promised us, the truth will set us free. So in the brief time we have left, let's talk about four action steps of how you can stop looking for the living among the dead and instead start living the abundant life that God really intends you to live. Are you ready for that? If you're still with me, would you say, hit me with it, G, I'm ready. Awesome. Action step number one, face the truth. Face the truth. Alcoholics Anonymous calls it taking a fearless moral inventory of yourself. Identify all the things in your life, all the misconceptions, all the misinterpretations, all the baggage, all the disappointments, all the scars, all the destructive habits, all the patterns, all the toxic relationships that are preventing you from experiencing the abundant life that God wants for you. Prayerfully, ask God to help you figure out what those things really are in your life. Where are you looking for the living among the dead? And be honest with yourself. Take a fearless moral inventory. Denial is a river in Egypt, but it is not a healthy way for you to live out your life, right? King David wrote this in Psalm 139. Let's pray this together out loud. We're going to put it on the screen. Would you just pray this with me as your prayer today? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So it's time to take a brutally honest look at all of our anxious thoughts, at all of our offensive ways, all the ways we're looking for the living among the dead, all the dead places, all the dead habits, all the dead relationships, all the dead dreams, all the dead pursuits that are blocking the river of life that God wants to flow through you. 
Now again, when you came in this morning, you received a couple of dead bodies, right? Hopefully at home you've made a couple of paper dolls or at least have a couple of pieces of paper of your own. On the back of this, it says, I will not look for the living among the dead. Amen. And so here's what I want you to do. You're going to hold on to one of these and take this home with you. You're just going to use one here today. And I want you to take that pencil that you received. And I want you to be praying about this and think about at least one thing, one dead thing, one dead thought, one dead practice, one dead habit in your life that's preventing you from fully experiencing the abundant life that Jesus has for you. Prayerfully ask God to search your heart and help you find at least one habit or attitude or pursuit or relationship or mindset that you have that leads to death, that leads you away from abundant life, and write it on the face or the body somewhere on this side of this doll, this dead body doll. Maybe for you it's an alcohol problem or an eating problem or a drug problem. Maybe it's workaholism. Maybe you have anger issues. Maybe you have self-hatred issues. Maybe you have a defeatist, pessimistic attitude that keeps you from trying new things. Maybe you're in a relationship right now where the other person is abusive toward you. They don't value you. They don't cherish you. They don't treat you right. Maybe you're in an immoral, physical relationship. Whatever it is for you, pray, listen to the answer of what your number one way is that has seemed right to you in the past, but you know right now, you know in your heart, its way leads only to death, and write it on one of these. Maybe there's two or three for you. Maybe it's not just one. Maybe it's two or three things. Write them down. Face the truth, because the truth is going to set you free. Don't put your name on it. Keep it anonymous. We're going to do something with it here in a minute. Hold on to your other dead body for now. Don't write anything on it. Take it home with you. And just keep praying David's prayer all week. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And as he brings more things to your mind, write them on that one that you have at home. We did this uh, six years ago, the last time we did this kind of practice, and Renee was telling me she still has hers from six years ago. It's on her kitchen uh, refrigerator, stuck with a magnet. So I hope you'll hold on to this and think about it. So what's keeping the living water? from flowing fr through you as freely as it should. And then the second action step is we're going to bury the dead. So let me ask you a question. If you went and saw a movie and it was horrible, I mean, it was just awful, it was the worst movie you had ever seen, would you go back and pay to watch it again? And then go back and pay to watch it again? And then go back and pay to watch it again? If you went to a restaurant, and it was the worst restaurant, the most horrible service, the worst tasting food, and it gave you food poisoning, would you go back to that same restaurant and order that same dish again and again and again? Of course not, right? If we keep doing what we've always done, we'll always get what we've always got. That's true in life, isn't it? So let's stop returning to those anxious thoughts and offensive ways in our life as well. Let's stop returning to the ways that used to seem right to us, but now, with God's help, we realize they lead only to death. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have the power of God living inside of you to change your life. You're not a victim. So stop looking for the living among the dead. You won't find it. Abundant life isn't in the graveyard. So I want you to take that first dead body, the one you wrote your dead thing or dead things on, and in a moment, I'm going to ask you to come forward and just drop it in this box that we've called the tomb and then we're going to do something else with that. Again, don't put your name on it. Nobody needs to know what's written on your card except you and God. Let's bury the dead. So we're going to do it just like this. I'm going to take my dead body. I'm going to write my thing. And then I'm just going to come up. And I'm going to read the back as I drop it in. I will not look for the living among the dead. Amen. And I'm going to drop it in the box just like that. So that's what we're going to invite you to do in just a moment, right? And then we'll talk about it a little bit more. So while you do that, we're going to show you a short video. My friend Gary Ross, he's played the piano and the trumpet for us on weeks that Patsy's not able to be with us at the second service. And he and a bunch of his friends from all around the world 
uh, put together a little uh, tribute to Jesus for Easter Sunday. And so we're going to play that video as you guys take turns uh, coming up. We do want to try and keep distancing as much as possible, so don't become a massive clump here at the front, but sort of take turns and let one row go and the next row go, and let's all participate in this, if you will. Let's watch this video by Gary as we do that. <laughs> You know, when Jesus was placed in the tomb, we've already talked about this, they came and they sealed the tomb, and they put Pilate's seal across the stone to let people know that there would be penalty of death if anyone broke that seal and went in. And so this went on, right? This was Friday night, and they came into the tomb looking for the body of Jesus. We talked about that. The women came in, the angels were there. And they asked him, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen, right? And so they went and they looked, and for sure the tomb had been moved. The, uh, the stone had been moved away, and the tomb was empty. That's my David Copperfield trick for today. So, you know, when this happened, Jesus took the power of all of our sins and he buried it in the grave with him. But then he rose again on Easter morning. 
He left the power of sin buried in the ground. And on Easter morning, the tomb was empty. What's that mean for us? That means sin has no power over you if you belong to Jesus. And all of those things that seemed right to you before, you realize now they end only in death. And if you realize that, then the power of them over you is gone. They have no power over you anymore because the tomb is empty, right? In addition to telling us to bury the dead, the Apostle Paul also reminds us to pursue life. That's our third action step today. Pursue life. Paul writes this in Romans 12. Do not be conformed to this present world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may test and approve what is the will of God, what is good and well-pleasing and perfect. After you weed a garden... It's much easier to see all the good flowers, right? It's the same way. Once dead things are buried, it's much easier to spot the living things because the things that are still moving, the things that are still growing, those are the ones that are alive. So start pursuing the things of abundant life that Jesus has in mind for you. Start doing the things Jesus calls you to do. Maybe you have had the experience of doing everything you can think of to change your life for the better, and you say, Greg, it seems like nothing works. I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and it doesn't get any better. It's always the same thing. I just want to quit. But you remember Thomas Edison found over 6,000 successful ways to not make a light bulb. And Colonel Sanders was refused 1,009 times when he first tried to get restaurants to sell his fried chicken before he heard his first yes. Walt Disney was turned down 302 times before he finally got financing for his dream of creating the happiest place on earth. And often when I talk to people and they say, oh, I've tried everything. I say, how many things have you tried? Uh, Three. Three? We haven't tried everything. There's 6,000 ways to not make a light bulb. How could you have tried everything if you've only tried three? We all have problems, right? Don't quit. Don't give up. We all have disappointments and frustrations in life, but it's always how we deal with the setbacks that's going to shape our life more than anything else. And our God is bigger than the boogeyman. If you believe that, would you say, yay, God? Many of you know, seven and a half years ago, Annette and I were bankrupt. I was unemployed. I was recovering from a catastrophic gasoline burn explosion injury on my hands, my face, my head, the post-traumatic stress disorder that comes with that particular bag of worms. Uh, I just won't sugarcoat it. Life was looking really grim for a while. But you look at my life now. I still have my beautiful bride of 31 years. I have a dream job. I get to serve Jesus and all of you while living in a dream location surrounded by awesome people who love us with the aloha that they can, all the aloha they can possibly give, right? My life is blessed right now. But here's the thing. My life was still blessed seven and a half years ago when all that was going on. My circumstances were different, but my God was the same. Amen? So that's what's your life, right? You've got some things you don't like. There's some circumstances that really stink, that you wish weren't true in your life. But your God is still your God, and He's still bigger than the boogeyman. He still has blessings for you. God still has a plan and a purpose for you. That was true in my life seven and a half years ago. I'll confess, I didn't always see it at the time. But listen to this. Don't miss this. You've heard this before. I'll say God is good, and you say all the time, right? God is good, and all the time, you've got to hold on to that. That's always going to be true, no matter what the circumstances of your life are. My life and all my goals and all my hopes and all my dreams, they were sitting in a success graveyard seven and a half years ago. But I was able to rise back from the dead because I didn't fall for the enemy's trap of looking for the living among the dead. Instead, we said it's time to look for a new chapter of life through the abundant life gift relationship with Jesus Christ. If I can do that, you can do that, whatever it is you're facing right now. In Ephesians 4.22, Paul said we need to lay aside the old man. We need to bury him. But he also said, be renewed, be reborn, right? Be recreated, be resurrected in the spirit of your mind. Put on the new man. In other words, pursue life. Sometimes you want to pursue life and you want to change the course of your life, but you just aren't sure where to begin. So what do you do? Action step number four, just do the next right thing. 
I've shared this many times before. It's what I'd call one of my diamond level life lessons, right? This is massive. Don't miss this. Just do the next right thing. You don't have to have your whole life figured out. You don't have to have the next five years figured out. You don't need a five-year plan or a 10-year plan. You just need to do the next right thing. Take the next right step. Live aloha, stay pono. You don't have to know the whole future. God knows the whole future. That's his job, not your job. You just keep doing the next right thing. Thing and trust God to take care of the rest. Jesus said if we believe in him, we will have eternal life and abundant life. Jesus said if we have faith in him, rivers of living water will flow out of us and our lives. And Paul told us that God has a specific will for your life. He tells us it is a good, a well-pleasing, and a perfect will for your life. Trust all that. Trust that God has already figured out what all the really hard stuff is for us. All we have to do is keep asking God, what do I do next, Lord? What do I do next, Lord? What do I do next, Lord? And just take the next right step. Do the next right thing. We don't have to get bogged down in massive to-do lists and five-year plans. We don't have to be overwhelmed with conquering all the details and discerning all the right chess moves of life because our God is the master chess player. He's an infinite number of moves ahead of us. And all we need to do, all we need to do is take the next right step. Do the next right thing. Let Jesus speak into your life right now. Stop looking for the living among the dead. It's time for you to rise. Let your relationship with God replace your religion about God. Let the living water flow through you so that you can live the abundant life. Now, real quickly, I don't have a lot of time, but those of you who were with us for Palm Sunday and Good Friday, I want to connect those two messages with Resurrection Sunday as well. I've mentioned before, Yeshua fulfilled all three spring feasts of the Lord. He fulfilled the summer feast of the Lord, what we call Pentecost. When he comes again the second time, he'll fulfill the three fall feasts of the Lord as well. And the spring feast he fulfilled with his resurrection is the Feast of First Fruits. And we don't have time to talk about it today, but if you're ready to hear what Paul Harvey used to call the rest of the story, if you saw part one and part two, you got to come back Wednesday night and hear part three. How did Jesus fulfill the Feast of First Fruits with his resurrection? That's the third and final part of our Pesach series. I hope you'll join us Wednesday night. Let's pray together as Joel and Benny and Al come to lead us in our closing worship song. Father God, Help us stop looking for the living among the dead. True life can only be found in one place, in the person of Jesus Christ. I pray for everyone here today, everyone watching online, that we would make this decision if we haven't already. I will stop looking for the living among the dead, and I will seek Jesus for my life, for the abundant life that he offers. You might decide today, God, I finally am ready to put my trust in Jesus. I have confidence that he is who the Bible says he is, that he did what the Bible says he did, and that he will do everything he's promised to do. I have confidence in that. I have faith. I have trust in that. So I put my faith in you, Jesus, as God, as the Lord of my life. And I put my trust in you as the leader of my life. You're smart. I'm not. You've got a plan. I don't. You lead. I'll follow you. You're God. I'm not. You be my God. You be my Lord. You be my leader. And then you would say, Jesus, I believe that you did die on the cross. What we call Good Friday. You became all of the sins of every human being who ever lived, ever will live. You took the penalty for every mistake, every crime, every sin of every person ever. And you took all of the power of all of those sins into the tomb with you. You buried all of those dead bodies with you. And then when you rose again from the tomb, you left the power of all of that sin in the ground. It has no power over us at all anymore. We can be the new man. We can be the new woman. Because we have you. And so Jesus, thank you for doing that on the cross for me, for paying my penalty on the cross. I accept the payment you made on my behalf, and I thank you and ask you to be my Savior. 
Jesus be the Lord and Savior of my life. Guide my path. Lead me through the abundant life on this earth into the land of eternal life in the next world to come. If that's the prayer of your heart today, you can just say, me too, God, me too. What Pastor G just prayed, that's what I want. I want to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus. I want to live the abundant life. I want rivers of living water flowing through my life. I want to stop looking for the living among the dead. I want to stop pursuing the ways that seem right to me, but in the end, only lead to death. Help me trust you and walk in the way everlasting with you as my leader, as my God, as my Lord, as my Savior. If that's the prayer of your heart again, you can just send me to. If you're watching online, type me to. Me to, God. And if you prayed a prayer like that today for the first time, especially if it's for the very first time you've ever decided to become a follower of Jesus, send me an email, Scott at gmail.com and say, Greg, I just became a follower of Jesus. What do I do next because again as i said christ is risen that's good news it'll always be good news but he rose 1988 years ago what's going on in your life today as a result of that great truth is it abundant is it living it needs to be what's the next step if you don't know send me an email and i'll guide you i'll disciple you along the way god bless each person here today bless each one watching online May they be renewed with your Holy Spirit today. May they feel the power of your plan for their life, of good, pleasing, and perfect will for their life as they're transformed into being the person you want them to be. That's my prayer for all of us today. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen.